Hello, everyone. Uh, I'll go out and come back. Well, maybe I don't have to. Okay. Okay, there we go. So it looks like it's working. Okay, so yeah, it looks like the slides I uploaded to the website is not updated. So I'm not sure why, but um, I'll share the link here if you want to download that. So let's get started. So in today's lecture, we'll be talking about question answering and retrieval. So first of all, the assignment one is due next Tuesday. So it's one week from today at 11 p.m. Um, so please start assignment one as soon as possible so that you can get help on assignment one on Thursday's lab session. Otherwise, if you start after that, then probably you will have to yeah, um, do everything on your own, even if you have adult, uh, some questions. Um, and um, so I'm, st I'm still recovering from COVID. Well, I think I'm uh, quite good now. I just wanted to um, be extra careful. So, um, I made to today's lecture uh, via Zoom, but then starting next week, I'll be back and uh, lectures will be in person again. So um, I'll see you there. Although, yeah, um, we have we still have the lab sessions um, via Zoom. So please don't come when there's lab, not lecture. So in fact, so we're gonna talk about question answering and uh, retrieval today. And well, I was originally planning to actually do all, uh, cover all of these in the last lecture. I usually cover five topics. And then um, I think we ran out of time. So I'm gonna cover the rest of three. And then, um, yeah, I think that might end the class a bit sooner. So um, as a recap, really quick recap, Yeah, there's a question by the way okay yeah so number one is it is your naming convention you like us to use well i think it's good to put your uh, student idea name just in case um because 
you know, when we're grading it, we probably download it and then try to grade it. And then we don't want to make mistakes. So that would be really nice. Although I don't think um, I wrote to enforce it. I mean, I don't think I wrote in the assignment to enforce it, but um, it would be nice to actually put your name and ID. So let's do that if you can. Um, so if you submit PDF IPMB file, should we zip them into tar.gz? I, I, so you should be able to submit multiple files in the um, in the, uh, the KLMS. So, um, well, you should be able to just upload two files instead of zipping it. And let me know if you cannot, but then if you can, I, I recommend you to actually uh, upload them separately instead of uh, putting them into one tar.gz because um, it's easier for the graders to actually look at those PDF files. Okay. So let me know if you have any other question. All right, so as a really quick recap, so we talk about token classification in the last lecture, right? And we we're talking about the NER. Um, how can we do biotagging to extract entities? And then, well, um, today's topic is actually related to that. We are still doing token classification, but then it's a bit different problem setup and we call this machine reading comprehension. So here, uh, input is text and question. So for instance, if you look at the example here at the right, you have a document from the Wikipedia. So this is like the document. So my pen is not working again. There we go. So this is the Wikipedia document. And then you give a question which can be answered by reading the document. And then, um, well, the answer is gravity. So what causes per uh, precipitation to fall is gravity. So now the setup is a bit different, right? Because now we don't have just one input, but we have two inputs, question and the Wikipedia document. So one important question to answer first is how can we handle two inputs? And the second question, second, second uh, difference is that, well, maybe this is a bit more familiar because we have done NER, but then the expected output is a span in the text. So um, it's trying to give an answer in a text form, but then that text form is not 100% uh, free form, but then it has to be a span in the text. Well, it's so you might ask why they did that, and um, well, if you do it in free form, it becomes very difficult to evaluate because there are so many true answers. So maybe you said uh, something else, and that might be true. Not just gravity is the answer, but there may be other answers too, and it's really hard to evaluate um, automatically if that answer is correct or not. So by enforcing the answer to be a span, it makes model it makes it very easy to evaluate because there are only a few possible answers anyway in the wiki document. So it's easier to actually enumerate all possible answers. So it is important to note that the um, first of all, when we want to handle two inputs, there were several methods over a long period of time. I mean, like two to three years, and then at the end. As we will learn in the um, large language model, uh, it's never too bad actually to just concatenate those two inputs and just consider it as one input. So it's like um, you talk about the wiki document and then you talk about the question right away. So it's like uh, you know one single passage that one single paragraph that contains both document and question. So you concatenate these two. Of course, you, of course, sometimes you put some special token in the middle so that you, you want to indicate uh, where they're being, where the separation comes from. But then uh, in, a, in either case, whether you put that or not, um, you will see that it's usually the best idea to concatenate them 
But if you look at the, um, the previous work in 2017, 2018, uh, 2016, then there are a lot of work talking about how you can handle two inputs by creating some complicated model that models the interaction between those two inputs. And at the end, um, apparently, um, transformer-based model replaced everything with concatenation of the two inputs. So how about the output? Well, it's actually a bit easier problem than NER, right? Because NER, um, you still have the prop, uh, have, you have to handle the issue of uh, having multiple possible spans in the doc text document. But then here, we know that there will be only one answer or we want the model to output only one answer. Then that means, uh, there are several ways to do this. One is we can still use biotagging. So beginning, uh, intermediate, and others. Another way is that you can just try to predict whether each token is start, and or others, right? So it's not B and I, but then it's B and E in some sense, um, if you want to compare that against the, uh, um, the biotagging. So um, that's for the first difference. So that means then um, suppose that the answer is within a cloud. If this was biotagging, then I would wanted to do something like B, I, I, right? But then if this was a, a start and end, then what you do is then start and A is others and um, end is E. You see the difference? But there's one more thing we can do better than this. That is, well, we know that there will be only one start and one end. Then if you do classification token level, then the problem is that it's possible that you might have multiple S. Of course, if the model is good enough, then that might not happen, but then we want to enforce that there is only one S. So, um, Unlike token classification, where you try to classify each token into um, S, um, S, or S, O, or E, uh, we can do this better by actually trying to classify, well, to be more exact, uh, trying to locate the star token in the entire token space. So maybe it's not super clear, um, during the lecture, but then it will be more clear when we're doing the lab session on Thursday, because we're gonna see how, how that goes in action. But you can think of this as um, you're defining a probability distribution on the words, and then you take a softmax on the, uh, uh, in the word axis. So let me just give a very quite um, 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 straightforward example. So anyway, so MRC can be then modeled uh, as follows, right? First of all, your input is basically the concatenation of the question and the context. And the output is a token level three-way pub public distribution. But then this is something that we want to actually make a, a bit of a tweak compared to what we know from the biotagging. Loss can be um, average of cross entry before every token. This is also something uh, that's, um, well, Something that we we want we might we might want to change if we want to take the cross entropy across the tokens. Model can be just uh, something like bidirectional LSTM, right? Why not? But let's talk about this. So what I mean by here is that suppose that the um, let's say let's um, have a sample same example like um, suppose um, I don't know. South Korea is uh, peninsula. And then let's say that the um, what the question was, which country is a peninsula? Then the answer is South Korea, right? If we wanted to do this on the token level, then we want to do, I mean, same as a biotagging that we just want to, uh, we want to map this to some embedding with the neural network. And then the base, this basically gets classified into three possible 
categories, right? Um, B, E, or O. So this will be a biotagging way. But then if we want to this uh, a smarter way, then instead of doing this, what you can do is, you still do the same um, mapping from the word to embedding, right? Um, same here, here. But then what you do now is that, um, well, now you actually map each embedding to some score. So it's a scalar value. Of course, this will involve linear mapping. And then what you can do is that now you can take softmax here. And then try to, for instance, um, predict south to be the beginning. So you basically give a loss on um, this probability. You basically do maximum likelihood estimation. And of course, this is just for the start, right? So you have to actually create a um, second scale value from the embedding, which is for the end token. And then you do the same thing and then take the soft max. So that, that way then you are sure that you will be optimizing for one value in the entire token space. Okay, so we, we, this will be more uh, clear later. Okay, so um, biotaking works by classifying each word into B, I, or O. So um, for instance, um, if you want to actually um, extract South Korea, then it will be uh, South will be B and Korea will be I. Um, so the, pro the point here is that the biotaking is for um, extracting the named entities from the um, text. So you might have uh, South Korea, these are locations. You might have people's name, uh, for instance. Um, yeah. Um, Joe Biden, for instance, yeah, then it's people, people's name, but then you want to actually um, tag with a B person and I person. It might be organization like KAIST, then you want to classify that with a B, KAI, B organization and I organization. Um, yeah, if you have any question, um, let me know too. Is that clear or do you need more recap? Okay. Yeah, by the way, the, um, the uh, lecture videos are on YouTube. So feel free to uh, watch them before coming to the lecture, I mean, previous lecture, right? So we tried to use lab session to do recap, but then I think um, there's a pros and cons. Uh, we use lab session to do recap. So I think it's uh, easier for us to work on some um, coding, but then I think also other issues that uh, we don't have enough recap during the lecture of, uh, but then we also don't want to spend too much time on recapping. Um, otherwise we cannot make progress. So I think probably the one of the best way is that you can use lab session to uh, recap. And then maybe if you do not remember uh, things well, then you might want to come to the class uh, after watching the um, YouTube video. So, um, but yeah, good question though. Please let me know anytime if you have any question. Very uh, welcome. Um, one issue is that the LSTM, when now you're handling really long sentences or documents, is no more good enough in many cases. So it is, uh, well, well, the reason is actually quite obvious because LSTM, as you know, is a sequential model. So you have to actually go through a lot of tokens um, to actually propagate some information from one place to another. So suppose that you want to propagate the information from uh, meteorology here, right? To maybe like here. That it actually has to go through all these, um, well, tokens and linear updates, linear transformation to get to within the cloud, right? 
And there's no way that this information can reach within a cloud without going through those tokens with just LSTM. And that's really a big problem because, well, let's even see for humans. Like when humans are reading it, they can refer to um, distant words very um, immediately by just looking at those words. Not every time going through every word when you're trying to move your focus from one word to another, right? So basically, um, LSTM is limited in that sense. You don't have a direct access to um, other tokens, especially distant tokens. Um, but then still, if you want to make a good model for MRC, then uh, it is clear that uh, the model has to be sufficiently aware of distant tokens. So what is the solution for this? Well, um, the solution is actually a tension mechanism. And it is possible that, um, well, depends on how we want, where we want to talk about tension because attention was actually first introduced in the um, machine translation model. So, well, to be more exact, this was um, published in 2015, although archived, I think in 2014. Um, but then, um, and this is our next topic, the encoder decoder or generation machine translation, all these um, topics. And I was thinking about where we should discuss this. And um, if we do, well, chronological order, then probably it's, it's better to do this earlier. But then um, I think um, it makes more sense to actually just talk about attention very, very uh, roughly, but then not really go into that much. Um, we'll get back to this later. But then I think you just want to, um, it's good, just good to at this point know that attention mechanism allows you to basically make uh, ac direct access from uh, one word to a distant word. And that shortcut basically gives a lot of uh, power. And so it's important to know that this is direct access. And in fact, apparently this motivates the development of transformer. Its paper's title was attention is all you need. So I think it's quite apparent that it's using attention. Um, and then it has become a general purpose architecture for modern AI. So um, it's really important to understand attention mechanism, but uh, for now, um, I think it's sufficient with just this information. Let's come back to this later. But anyways, let's say that we have some sort of a now direct access. Um, then now we can hope that the MRC will work well. And now you might be wondering, um, you might have heard of a, a question answering too. In fact, that's our uh, topic, right? So um, I think I hear a lot of questions. What is the difference between um, question answering and MRC? It's quite confusing. And well, I think there is no single right answer or the best answer, um, but I think there are several well, first of all, why is there such confusion? Because um, these terminologies were developed in recent like five to 10 years. And such duration of time is too short to um, have a very formal definition on these kind of things. So you can think of this as it's not formally defined, but then it'll become better and better as time goes. You're basically in the, uh, in the middle of uh, in the transition or I mean, in the settlements of these terminologies, these terms. But um, let me just give it your answer. So, um, so question answering, it's very apparent to define it as task of finding the answer to the question input, right? And machine reading comprehension by definition is really about whether a model can, machine can actually read something and comprehend. So I think it's good to think of it this, this way. Question answering really focuses on the application itself because basically question answering is uh, the success of question answering depends on whether the model can successfully answer the question, which is really application. Whereas the MRC really focuses on the machine's ability to read and comprehend. So it's more of a scientific thing. It's more of a MRC focuses on whether the machine actually has understood. And maybe some people will say um, model can still answer questions, but maybe it has not understood the documents. And of course, there is no way to really prove it or disprove it, but um, you can think of, you, that's the, new, the difference in the nuance, right? 
So we can think of it as also question answering doesn't care about what knowledge it refers to as long as the answer can be obtained. So it's really objective, objective oriented, not object, by the way, object is, um, object oriented is a programming paradigm here, objective oriented. Um, while MRC requires the model to read the accompanying text to obtain the answer. So it's more of a method oriented or whether um, you're more interested in the internal or inherent ability, ability than um, its actual performance or accuracy. But in the community, question answering sometimes refers to MRC. So it's very confusing. And note that the knowledge graph question answering refers to question answering via referring to structured data called knowledge graph. So uh, it's also something a bit different from MRC or uh, just plain question answering. And there's now, now a term called open domain question answering. So, so this is actually really, I think, also a confusing term too. Um, although it's very popular in the community, so it's not really possible to not use the term as well. But I think it's quite, uh, quite confusing because, um, well, question answering is the really the task of answering questions. And then now you say open domain. So um, you're talking about uh, different domains. And when people hear about this without really knowing the literature, they think that, oh, is it then, um, then there is a, uh, well, question answering is dealing, this is dealing with uh, different domains rather than just one domain. And well, that is not really a wrong answer, but I think it's not really uh, accurate answer too, because here open domain really means that you're referring to a very large set of documents instead of just one. So here then domain is really referring to each document, then closed domain is more of a um, single document question answering. And it's uh, a bit weird because if you say single document question answering, um, is a closed domain. I mean, it's it's it. I, don't, I I personally think it's quite quite weird to say that a single document or a few document is a domain. Um, I think it's more natural to think of the entire Wikipedia as a domain, for instance, or maybe on a sciences domain, but not usually a document. But anyways, um, what I wanted to say is that um, uh, ODQA is a very popular term uh, that uh, in the literature a lot of people use, but I think maybe a, a bit more accurate way to say is something like question answering on web scale text data, um, something like that. Or if you think this is not easy to understand, then you can think of that way when we say open domain question answering. So although we will be using the term a lot. So, um, so then now, how do we actually approach ODQA? So one of the most common and intuitive methods for the QA is a retrieve and read. So um, let's say now we know what read means, right? Read is basically MRC. You are given a document and the model is able to extract the answer from it using something similar to biotagging, right? Then now question is how we can retrieve, right? Um, and how do they interact with, with uh, each other? So. Uh, one first finds a few relevant documents to input query in the reference web corpus. So it's like a search engine. Uh, you're given a question and then you find a few documents that are re related to the question. And then an MRC model runs on the documents to output the final answer phrase. Quite simple, right? It's basically a um, pipeline model that you reduce the search space. Um, okay. so. But now, of course, we need to be delving more into how Retrieval works. So you can think of Retrieval as uh, um, reducing a search space from billions of passages to a few passages so that the reader model can obtain answer by reading them in a short amount of time. So the general assumption is that we have a reader, which is very accurate, but also very slow. Um, so we cannot use the reader model to read everything on Wikipedia or something very large. So we want to reduce the search space, search space first, and then in the reduced search space, the reader reads them carefully to get the answer. And I think it's quite similar to how people also get the answer from these documents too. Well, um, of course, they don't really uh, search through, but then let's say you went to library and you want to get an answer to a question like when was... Um, uh, the, for instance, um, 
when was uh, Chosun founded, the nation Chosun. Then, well, then, then you might be wondering where you should go in the library. And probably you want to go to the history section because it's about history. And then maybe you want to read a paper that, not read a book that actually is, has a title Chosun. And then Chosun's uh, its first letter is J. So you might want to go to the uh, section J and then history and then the letter J and then you find a book that's related to Chosun and then read it and then you might be able to find the answer. And it's quite similar, right? Because um, you basically are going through retrieval phase by um, searching through in the, on, in the high level. For instance, going to the history section and then going to J and then you actually pick up the book and then read carefully because you are, um, you are reading speed is very slow. You cannot possibly read every book in the library. Anyways, so um, that's the point of uh, retrieval. And then now we can divide this problem into two steps, right? Um, one is that we want to first embed a question passage um, so that we can do search. So um, if you're not really familiar with the um, uh, how the nearest neighbor search, then you might be wondering why we're obtaining embedding. Uh, you can think of this as uh, you are mapping these question passage to the vector space. So suppose uh, we're gonna see this diagram in the next slides too, but then let's say the um, passage one is here in the vector space. Of course, this can be very high dimensional, not two dimensional. And then if you have a question that maps to a vector space like here, then we know that the question on P1 is very close by. So then we might want to read P1 first. So that's why we actually map these to vector space. And then we, of course, want to search when to find uh, the passage that has the highest similarity or uh, the lowest distance. And this is also not trivial when the number of passages is very large and also the vector space is very large. Yeah. All right, so um, now, so, um, this is like a very, uh, uh, well, very the simplest way to explain how retrieval works. Query maps to embedding, passage maps to embedding, and then you compare between the embeddings, you compute the similarity. And this similarity, of course, is, uh, um, there are several ways to measure that. One way is that you uh, compute the uh, nearest neighbor, which is L2 distance. Other is that you can compute inner product. We're gonna go into that. But then if you first basically compute the similarity and then you find the passage with the highest similarity. Okay, it's very simple though, right? It's like argmax operation. And um, again, as I've um, drawn in the diagram, passage and map, uh, map to the vector space first. This is done offline. And then when a question comes in, it is mapped to the same vector space and find the most similar passage. So there are um, several ways to map each passage and question to the vector space. That's really the question, right? How can we map the passage and the question to the same vector space? Oh, okay, yeah, good questions. What's the difference between the usage of document passage? Actually, when I say document and passage here, uh, I'm referring to the same thing. Yeah, so, sorry for the confusion. So um, I'm talking about the same thing. Hmm. Okay, so bag of words is um, um, one of the easiest way to map a document to vector space. So actually it's very rel related to the one hot vector we talked about in, uh, in the lecture one or two. But then the difference is that now instead of having one hot vector, you have actually multiple hot, uh, multi hot vectors, where the hot dimensions refer to um, the word, the, the fact that the document has that word. So, for instance, let's say we have uh, two documents, it was the best of times. Then, if we wanted to map, for instance, the best to one hot vector, then we have a uh, we want to create a vector of the same size as the size of vocab. And then we want to just have a word that corresponds, no, dimension that corresponds to best one, right? 
That's why we had something like um, zero, one, uh, zero, zero, zero. So one half, that's, this is one half vector. We're doing something similar, but then now the difference is that instead of doing one hot, we're actually doing multi hot, which means you just have one for every word that the document has. You can also think of this as um, actually summation of the one hot vectors because, uh, well, not exactly, depending on the how the bagel words is implemented, sometimes bagel words ignores multiple words per document. They just treat that same as one word. Sometimes actually they count how many they are. But if you're doing counting, um, then it's same as basically, um, let's say the each one hot vector is x1 to xt, then basically this speckle word is equivalent to um, summation of uh, xi1 to t, right? Then it will be same thing as this multi-hot multi -hot vector. Um, if you want to, of course, uh, enforce um, all these ones, uh, all these uh, non-zero values to be at most one, then of course you can also do something like this, and then um, you can flatten them, right? So you can basically apply something like uh, one comma this value, right? And then in this case, then of course you will get um, at most one. It gets flattened because it's something like this, right? Okay. Um, and of course, yeah, this will be never negative. So actually you will never get here. So it's actually only operating on this space. Um, yeah, so that's bag of words. And that's very useful because um, it's really easy to compute and it's also um, containing all the words. It's very easy way to uh, make a vector of a document. Um, and we were just talking about the Unigram bag of words actually, because we we're just actually um, talking about, well, whether each word is in each um, document or not, but then, it is also possible to uh, generalize to arbitrary n grams, either two gram or um, three gram, four grams, which means we want to see if uh, not just one word, but then a concatenation of uh, two words is in the um, in document. So if we're doing bigram, for instance, uh, if we're using same document, then we're using something like um, it was as a one vocab token and was the as a one vocab token. So even if the word it and was are in the document, if they are in the different places, they are not actually together. They're not side, to side, to side, side by side, then the biogram count will, will not go up. And you can, uh, of course, then this means then the vocab size is increasing a lot, right? Because if your vocab size was uh, originally say 100K, and then now if you're considering biogram, then you're effectively, um, your vocab size is at most something like 100K squared, which is uh, more than a billion, right? So it's important to note that when you go to biogram or n-grams, the size of vocab becomes very big, which means then, then the bag of words will be very sparse. And it's also worth noting that this, these vectors, you will never actually um, store the vector as dense form because it will be very sparse. So it's better to uh, store them in the sparse form. We're gonna see that um, in, the, uh, like in the lab session too. Um, so uh, when we're using, trying to compare the, these um, a bag of words, whether they are unigram or n-gram, we usually use cosine similarity which means uh, we uh, do first normalization of each vector and then we uh, compute inner product. Inner product is analyzed multiplication and then summation. So it's basically the same as matrix multiplication. But then if N is too large in the n-gram, as I said, we'll have a very large vocab. And then, um, I mean, something I already said, but it's very sparse. So which means that the inner product will be zero for most dimensions. And it, it can be very, um, not useful when vocab is very sparse because you will never see uh, n-gram that you saw in training data during test time. And if you, you, you never see then their dimension, their inner product will be always zero, then it's not really doing anything really useful. So um, anyways, 
Okay, so we're gonna have a actually a short five minute break at this point, actually, because I think lecture is getting longer than I thought. Um, let's have a five minute break now until 9.45, um, and then we'll come back for the rest of the lecture.
All right, welcome back. So let's get back to the um, TFIDF. All right, so, um, so TFIDF is one of the most popular ways to really perform the sparse retrieval. So um, if any of the big of words, as we just saw, is uh, quite limited, right? Because um, it gives the same weight to every word. So it means just, it just only considers whether a certain word is in the sentence or not. But we should really um, think, if you think about this, then we should really give a different weight to different words because some words have much more important information than others, right? So for example, we don't really care about common words like is or on when matching to, to two documents. If you ask someone whether two documents are similar or not, you will never consider whether they have a is or on. You will uh, consider uh, more about, for instance, like whether some entities like Barack Obama are really um, in both documents to really see the um, similarity. So really this is the motivation of the uh, invention of TFIDF, which basically tries to give more weights to more important words. Very good, uh, very simple way of um, thinking about it. So um, let's see how it really works. So let's suppose, let's define T to be each term and let D be the each document. Okay, then how we define it is that we want to compute the term frequency TF. Uh, so this basically refers to um, term frequency. And this is the um, uh, inverse doctrine frequency. So TF, uh, the function TF actually takes in two values, um, the term T and document D. So what it does is that it's a very simple thing. It just do, does the raw count of term T in the document D divided by number of words in the document. So it's very similar to actually back of words. This is actually very, very similar to back of words, um, except that, um, I mean, it depends on how you define back of words, but um, it actually gives more score to the terms if the term actually appears multiple times document. But the, um, the really the interesting part is IDF, but in order to define IDF, we want to first define DF, where DF is actually raw count of how many documents have the term T. So note that the DF doesn't depend on the document, whereas the TF actually depends on it, right? So uh, TF is uh, depending on two, two variables, T and D, where IDF just depends on T. Um, so DF, DF is a raw count of how many documents have the term T and IDF actually is computed by taking the log of N over DF over T. And it's just about really, um, well, actually giving a special characteristic on this function, which is that um, if DF is is equal to N, which means of course, the term appears in every document in the corpus, then what does this value become? Well, this become, well, before log, it will be one because N over N. And if you take a log of one, it becomes zero. So, which means if IDF becomes zero, then even if TF is very large, the TF IDF value will be still zero. So that's really the amazing characteristic of TFIDF, the fact that um, even if you have a lot of uh, terms occurring in documents, what really matters is what, how, how important that term is in general, or how rare the term is in the corpus. And let's say if DF is um, one instead. So here then the, um, the IDF is zero. If DF is equal to one, 
then what happens? Then you're taking log of n. So log of n is still, um, well, non-zero is, is a big value, but then still, because you're taking log, you are still um, uh, not, well, it's not as big as n, right? It's much smaller than n. Log is actually very powerful in reducing big numbers into small numbers. So um, the IDF will be, uh, well, it will be something higher than one, but still not too big. So what the IDF does is by putting the log in front is that um, you're still not giving really super high weight so that you have some balance, um, even if the uh, term is very rare in the document. But then when term is appearing in every document, then IDF becomes zero and then it really penalizes the uh, TF IDF in the, uh, in the best way it can. Okay, so it's a very simple way to um, compute the TF IDF. So again, there are several characteristics of uh, TF-IDF. Uh, one is that the high weights on the rare words, whereas nearly zero weight on the common words. So it's very effective for searching named entities, right? Because um, named entities are relatively rare. And when you have match of uh, named entities between the query and the uh, document, then it's very sure that you will actually have a very high value on that. Um, and also sparsity allows us to build a very efficient search index. It's called inverted index. Um, why this is so? Well, because, because we are, there are only a few documents that have certain words, then we can actually create an index, inverted index that basically contains, okay, which documents contain this word? And then of course that word corresponds to some dimension in this TF idea, right? And then when a document comes in, when one query comes in, if you see these uh, rare words, then you only have to look at those words that have, uh, you, only look at, look at, you only need to look at those documents that have those words. So let me give you an example. So suppose um, query is, um, Something like that, right? When was Kais founded? And um, suppose that though um, you have now, you have implemented some stop words. The stop words mean that you ignore these words because they're just too common. So probably when and was is too common that they don't really have any meaningful um, value. So you basically remove this, right? And then uh, some people might also remove found, but maybe we, do, we keep it. And then um, suppose now you look, you want to actually look at the documents um, that will have non-zero inner product or cosine distance with the I mean, cosine um, similarity with this query. Then it is clear that this um, the the it, the cosine similarity between Q and D will be non-zero if and only if the document contains um, KAIST or founded. And maybe there are a lot of documents that contains founded, but I'm pretty sure that there are very few documents in Wikipedia that contains KAIST. And if you can just remove also the founded um, prop using the, with as a stop word, then this basically only reduces the search space to say only maybe hundred documents in Wikipedia, where Wikipedia of course has more than uh, millions of documents. Then it becomes much easier to search through those documents and compute the um, the inner product. So that's that's really the um, the point of this inverted index. The fact that you you actually store the uh, list of documents that each word um, appears, so that you only have to look at those documents. In real search systems, though, um, there's a we make a slight modification to TF IDF, and we call it BM twenty five, and it's that's more often used. So for instance, um, if you think, look at this, uh, they're computing the score between D and Q. And when you compute score between D and Q, that means you're doing the uh, inner product on the normalized TF idea. And if you think about how actually you would compute on the, uh, the TF IDF side, well, it will be something like this, right? You want to, um, you want to compute of uh, um, 
D, and then you want to uh, do cosine, dis uh, cosine distance of that with the cosine similarity of that with here by the of Q. But um, because you are trying to find um, the, the best document, we don't really care about really um, any score. Um, well, I'll say that, um, so what I was trying to say is that if you actually um, dissect this into a TF and IDF, then this becomes um, TF of a term and each document, and then IDF of each document um, times TF of a um, term in the question. and IDF of uh, the term. Oh my bad, document. But then um, this value is not really important because you, uh, wait, my bad, IDF of query, right? But this value is not important because um, because you're looking for the documents and it doesn't matter what, what this value is. Um, it doesn't affect anything about the score at the end. This is a really, it's a fixed value. It's a fixed value given the query. So you, you can just ignore this. And you can think of the TFIDF as actually computing this um, really um, value. And if you compare this with the, um, um, the actual IDF here, uh, of course, you have to put the uh, summation of uh, T if you want to compute the inner product. Then if you look at this, um, you, you see that uh, there is a several um, same terms. First of all, you have IDF of the term, and then you also have IDF of the term here. Um, wait, my bad. Okay, I think... Uh, what I meant is that not document. Um, sorry, so IDF of uh, the term, and then of course IDF of uh, um, term in the question side, right? Because the IDF is actually on the term, not the documents, but uh, term and the corpus. So the IDF of uh, the term on the document side and the IDF of a term on the question side. But then we don't have to care about the IDF of a term on the question side. That's why we're canceling this out. I mean, we are ignoring them because it's a fixed value. So it's still the same thing. And then, so you're just, it's, uh, I still want to say the same thing. You're basically just doing the summation of these, uh, the multiplication of these three terms. And now you see that um, this is same as this. Right. So um, what BM25 is really doing is then it's replacing the multiplication of this these two TF values, these two TF values with uh, this. But um, you can really, um, well, BM25, you, you might want to try to understand it. Uh, there are some ways to really interpret it, but then um, it's just more of an empirical thing that's working well. So I'll probably stop here, explain what the M25 is. But uh, what I want to say is that it's not too much different from TFIDF, TF but there's some regularization and some term weighting happening. Okay, but anyways, in, in any case, but uh, you still see a TFIDF or BM25, just like Vega Voice, Matching only happens when the passage and the question share a term. And it means that we cannot handle a similar but different words such as good and best because they are very similar in the meanings but they're different in the um, word space. So we're actually gonna do five minute break here, but, um, but so there, that's, there comes the uh, really the, um, well, the, the dense field factors or dense retrieval, which exactly has the benefits where the sparse vectors struggle from. But also dense vectors actually struggle from what the sparse vectors are good at. So you can think of dense retrieval as because they're actually mapping the vector space, which is very dense. It looks like uh, this. Um, it's very good for capturing and syntactic and semantic information. 
even if the lexical form, the surface form is different, like good and bad, good and best, dense vectors are still sometimes able to um, capture that. But it's difficult to encode the precise lexical information because they tend to be uh, very close by in the vector space. The model may, may not be able to differentiate between the good and best uh, in a precise manner. And sparse vectors are, of, of course, the opposite, right? They're good at capturing lexical information because they assign one dimension per word. But it's very difficult to encode syntactic or semantic information because, well, um, if they're different, then there is no middle. It's just they're different. It's not like they're similar or they are different, but um, have the same meanings. And when you come back home to the dense um, retrieval, the um, searching becomes a really, uh, well, important and always hard problem too, because now you cannot use the, um, the inverted index that we talk about um, in the sparse retrieval, because there's no notion of, a, um, well, um, assignment or the, there's no notion of uh, the, the, well, the, the, um, whether a term exists in the, in the sentence or not. So what we have to do is like really actually we have to go back to how really we motivate this nearest neighbor search, which is um, we want to actually um, put them in the vector space and try to find the one that's the closest. And one of the um, easiest ways actually in, uh, to really um, do use L2 distance and do clustering. There are several metrics though. I mean, we, we don't just use L2. We use different kinds of metric. Um, but um, anyways, so the L2 is definitely one option. Um, we sometimes use L1. L1 is uh, Manhattan distance. So it's something like, let's say, uh, you have a two points here, then L, L, L1 is like that. In, this is L2, this is L1. Inner product is, um, well, you're just um, multiplying the two vectors and then just summing, summing the, um, the products. It's also called, um, when you actually use this in the search, you call it maximum inner product search because you're actually maximizing their values. It's actually the other way, right? L2 and L1, you want to minimize them in the um, inner product, you want to actually maximize them. And cosine distance is very similar to inner product um, in a sense that it's actually one minus um, inner product of the normalized terms. Um, and it's not really a, uh, well, distance, but um, still it's um, um, very similar to distance in a sense that if the distance is zero, then they're actually the same, but then there are some characteristics that cosine distance doesn't follow that uh, metric distance uh, is required to mathematically. Um, we, uh, we might be able to get to this in the lab session too, but I think there are a lot, a lot of things to cover, so we might not be able to, but uh, it's good to uh, really um, you know, keep in mind that there are several ways to really measure uh, the notion of uh, closeness Um, and then again, I talk about the problem with the dense vectors, which is that you cannot uh, search as efficiently as sparse because you cannot create a very good inverted index. But I, I meant that you cannot create an inverted index in a precise manner, but then you can still approximate it or you can approximately create an inverted index, something similar to inverted index. And that is actually by using um, something like k-means clustering. So if you um, suppose that, for instance, you have uh, um, like all these points and um, you have a, a new query comes in. Then you want to find the closest blue point to this query, uh, the black query point. And if you do this in a brute force way, then you want to compare this black point with every blue point and they'll be very inefficient. But then if you uh, use a cluster them and then just use the centroids of the clusters, which means uh, you basically have a clusters and there will be a centroid, right? And you just think of these centroids as the something that you first compare with the black point. And now you found that, oh, uh, the closest one is actually this one, right? And then um, now you only look at the points inside this cluster. 
when there are a lot of clusters, then you might want to look at a few uh, the closest clusters. Suppose then you now have say a number of clusters is um, say like uh, one million, and then there is a, a number of points per cluster. This is like one k. Then you're talking about about one billion points. And then suppose that you only look at the, the closest cluster when you're doing search, then now you're seeing that, of course you will do exact search within the cluster, but you now only have to go through how many searches. Uh, first of all, uh, you have to search through 1 million clusters. So you have to compare 1 million points and then you find just one, and then you just actually do exact search inside the cluster, which is only 1000. So in this case then, your um, time complexity will be only 1 million plus 1K. Um, this is much smaller than comparing with everything in the um, um, database, which is 1 billion. So then the art usually becomes, first of all, how many clusters you want to create uh, given the uh, number of points. Uh, usually rule of thumb is that you don't want to have a too many um, points in each cluster. So if you have 1 billion points, then something like 1 million or something like five, 500, 100, 100 clusters is a common. Um, anyways, um, so, uh, so I think um, I wanted to say that. And I think, wait. I'm not sure. Um, I think what I wrote here is not, um, yeah, it's not really accurate, but anyways, I think this is about really the inverted index. Um, so yeah, I think, no, I mean, it, it's actually accurate. I think I was going the other way. Yeah, I think I was a bit confused about how I actually uh, structure this slice. So this is what I've, what this paper is talking about the uh, inverted index after talking about MIPS, but then in fact, I talk about the inverted index first and now I talk about MIPS. So uh, whatever it's on this slide is about the inverted index for the sparse vectors. You can say the other way, right? MIPS is the inverted index for sparse vectors. So anyways, this has slides probably has to come first, but then uh, this is what I want to talk about in the, in the, um, in this, um, um, in this case, so um, we might we might be dealing with billions, if not trillions, of documents, and um, we want the search speed to be really fast. So we want to uh, basically uh, cluster these and then uh, have uh, some hierarchical structure when we're searching through it. It, it. it is hierarchical because you have your first layer search is the searching on the clusters, and then when you have search on the clusters, you want to only go into a few clusters and then go deeper only search through the points in each cluster. So it's basically two layer search. You can even go more layers in this hierarchy, right? Like three layers or four layers. These days, three layers is not too uncommon, but then if you have too many layers, usually the effectiveness decreases a lot. So I think usually two layers is the best. Uh, if there are a lot of points, then maybe three layers, but not probably four. And so these are the one, what I talk about, like what I just talked about. Um, so basically we create buckets and that, that bucket is basically the same thing as a um, cluster, right? And you actually compare with this entry. These are all what we talk about. And that's what, uh, what I talk about was the clustering based. Whereas there's also uh, other methods called, for instance, locality sensitive hashing, which um, it's more about not clustering, but you actually try to, um, um, you basically create, try to, create buckets in a different way where you um, actually put the points that are close to each other under the same uh, bucket instead of performing k-means clustering. Uh, in practice these days, um, clustering based is much more often used in LSH. Although this has very nice mathematical pro uh, property that it was initially, I think, popular, but then uh, clustering based is definitely more used these days. One of the reasons is that you can easily utilize uh, GPUs to compute the uh, k-means and it's very fast. Um, so it's much preferred. 
and also it's very stable and it's very um, easy to uh, comprehend, very transparent method. So um, generally recommended, although um, in many cases, it is not probably, uh, you know, required for you to create your, your library yourself. You will use existing library, which I'll talk about in the next slide. But there's also another idea. Instead of creating buckets, you might want to create a proximity graph, uh, which means that you actually connect graph connect points uh, where they are nearby and there becomes edges. And you start from a certain route and then you try to make this into a search problem. Because if you connect the nearby points with edges, then this is a, can be considered as a fully connected um, graph. And then you basically try to find the uh, traverse through all these points and find the closest vertex or close enough vertex. It's called, it's a local minima, but then um, you're reaching there when this distance is small, smaller than a threshold. Um, and HNSW, um, I actually put this paper on the class website. I think it's not updated yet. I have to double check. Um, please take a look if you're interested in this direction. It's considered as uh, one of the state of the arts. But disadvantage is that it takes up a lot of space uh, and a lot of time to build a graph because you have to compare between all the points and you have to construct a full graph on top of these points. So in practice, what people do is that it's very rare that people use this um, proximity graph directly. Whether what they do is that they, they first make clusters. And then if there are a lot of clusters, like million clusters, it's still slow to search through these million clusters. So you build a, another um, um, graph, you, you build a graph of the clusters, not the points, but then the graph of the clusters. So something like this, you have uh, suppose um, points, and then you basically now have a, um, clusters and centroids. And then you use this proximity graph to connect for instance like this. And then you can search through the centroids very fast. After you have found your best centroid, then you do the exact search. So again, as I told you, there are several libraries that you can perform NNS. Um, actually, I didn't put the Google's one. This is also pretty popular these days. I'll put that um, in on the website too. Um, but then uh, in practice, you rarely use, uh, you, you will rarely build your own NNS algorithm because it's very well defined and self-contained problem. So there are a lot of open source algorithms. So it's, it's more important to be able to uh, use them correctly. Of course, unless you're uh, really sp trying to specialize in this domain, your research. So there is a FICE, which is quite friendly with PyTorch, a noise from the Spotify. Um, you can also use Scikit-learn and also there is a, a Google library called Scan. So that's, I'm gonna put this, um, I'm gonna put this on the slides after the class too. Um, because we're using PyTorch in this class, uh, we'll be using FICE but, um, mainly, but you're welcome to try out other things too, if you're familiar. Okay, so uh, that's great. I think I was on time this time. So we just covered retrieval. And um, now this gives us, um, well, we have covered most kinds of formulations in NLP. We still have a, 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 some ways to go on the model side and the task side. Um, we're gonna go for um, uh, encoder decoder network in the next lecture, of course, after the discussion session on Thursday. And that will be basically the um, really where uh, a lot of uh, different things become possible in NLP because you're now not just classifying or finding something, but you're now generating something. And that, that that's where a lot of creativity can, can come in. So, um, and that uh, we're gonna use machine translation mainly for um, the task, but then of course there are different kinds of tasks you might be interested in uh, article writing or auto completion. Um, and later, of course, this goes into special learning and um, a lot of exciting things um, in, in uh, modern AI. In this class, probably we'll not be able to go into a lot of details that happened in the recent years, but um, that might be in the, um, in the uh, class that's, um, I mean, higher level class, not 605. Um, but anyways, uh, we're gonna wrap, it, wrap up here. So hopefully, um, you're doing well with your assignments. Um, we're gonna, uh, in the lab session on Thursday, we're gonna cover a few things 
that we did today in the lecture, but also we'll hopefully give you some time to ask questions on the assignment and also give you answers or some hints. All right, thanks everyone.